Welcome to Polaris Live. This is Sarwar Kashmiri inviting our viewers from around the world to the series of programs on the United States and China in the world. This program is brought to you in conjunction with the Foreign Policy Association in New York. I'd like to remind our viewers that you can ask questions throughout this program by using the comment button on the right-hand side of the, your screen. Time permitting, we'll get to as many of them as we can. Today's program is a very special one. The world of politics and geopolitics today is increasingly dominated by concerns about security. Securitization has basically almost taken over the science of geopolitics. It's not a very healthy situation. And it turns out since 1984, there has been a publication in Canada which reviews Canada's foreign policy in the past year and make some observations going forward. And we thought at Polaris Live that this is very, very important given the political structure in the world today, because there are so many countries with Canada uh, probably in the leadership that are faced with this triangulation issue of how to handle US-China relations with their country. And that's what this book has been trying to do for Canada since 1984. Uh, we have today with us one of the key authors and editors of this book and some other prominent writers in the book. And let me introduce uh, to you Professor David, uh, Professor David Carment. He's a professor at the Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University, Ottawa, Canada. He's a series editor of Palgraves Canada and International Affairs, editor of Foreign Policy Journal, fellow of the Canadian Global Affairs Institute. His research focuses on Canadian foreign policy, mediation, and negotiation, fragile states, and diaspora politics. So, uh, David, if it's okay with you, let me turn uh, this program now to you so you can introduce some of the key writers who are featured this morning. Uh, so you please take over from here. Well, thank you, Sarwar. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, this is an exciting time if you're working in uh, international affairs because, uh, as you pointed out, uh, there are a lot of decisions and crucial decisions that have to be made by countries, including Canada, on how they're going to navigate a very unstable system. And uh, what this particular volume does, and as you pointed out, uh, we've been doing this for the better part of 38 years. Canada Among Nations is the flagship publication of the school where I work, the School of International Affairs in Ottawa at Carleton University. What this volume is trying to do is determine how Canada is best placed to position itself with respect to this triangular relationship of which you speak. Uh, it's not just a matter of figuring out how um, Canadian policy, policy is best situated to uh, engage a rising China, but also how to engage other countries that are reacting to that, that rise, That's primarily the United States, but not exclusively. So what we've done, uh, we've uh, over the course of the last year, we've produced uh, the volume, as you say, it's an edited volume, and I've had the pleasure of working with one of our presenters, Jeremy Peltiel, uh, a colleague and uh, uh, recently retired, I, I'm sad to say, uh, from Carleton University, but still very active. Uh, he has uh, been a real driver of this project because of his knowledge on the region. Um, and Laura McDonald, also a colleague of mine at, uh, at, at, at Carleton University in the Political Science Department. And so the three of us collaborated and put together uh, what we think is a comprehensive assessment of Canada's place in the world. The intention of Canada Among Nations is to provide both a review and outlook. So we look at past policies and we also look ahead. And to be clear, the volume is very much focused on the policy dilemmas that Canada faces, uh, the problems that arise as a, as, virtue, as, as a result of Canada's position in the world with respect to China primarily and the United States. It's not always focused on these particular issues, but this year we thought this was probably the most important thing we could examine Canada and great power competition. So the volume is broken into three distinct sections, one focusing on trade, investment, and so on, and how Canada is grappling with the breakdown in the so-called uh, rules-based system and how it can navigate uh, a world in which its primary interests are improving the economy, 
uh, well, uh, coping with the system that is less predictable by virtue of that breakdown. Uh, our second section in the volume focuses on primary issues that are driving Canadian interests, uh, finance, culture, and digital economy, primarily but not exclusively, as well as trade. And in the third section, the section we're going to speak about today from our panelists uh, and hear from our panelists about some of the key issue here is the Canada-China relationship and how, how we engage uh, China, but also um, how we have specifically dealt with the, the issues that arise in engaging China and how the pressure brought to bear by the United States in particular has modified or shaped our policy options. So to give you an example, just to introduce our authors, we have three excellent uh, co contributions. I'm pleased to say that these are the best contributions that we can, I think, uh, put together that are really critical and assessments of Canada's position on a number of security issues that we're all aware of if we've been following these files, primarily the Huawei uh, crisis that emerged as a result of Meng Zhao's arrest uh, we also looking at the free trade dilemmas and the implications therein for relations with the United States. And we also look at the rise of China as a uh, center of development finance and what the implications of that are for uh, Western aid projects, but also specifically Canada's contribution to uh, development in sub-Saharan Africa. So um, I'll lead it off with... Uh, Greg Chin's piece, a professor from York University with a great deal of experience working with the Canadian government, who has an insider's look on how Canada grappled with the uh, shifts, if you will, in Canada's position on after striking a free deal, trade deal with China. Uh, as, we, as we know, Justin Trudeau came to power on the basis of supporting, uh, re-engaging China and building up our trade capacity with China. And all that changed over the course of the six or seven years he's been in power. Uh, sad to say that we are uh, not in a position right now to pursue a free trade agreement. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Greg to kick it off uh, in a discussion of what he found uh, to be uh, what he found to be uh, uh, happening on, beyond the uh, sort of public purview. Uh, and he provides us with an insider's look on on the Canada free trade agreement with China negotiations. Hey, Greg, before you go ahead, David, I wanted to ask you, do you know of any other publication like this for any other country that comes out on an annual basis or, or is Canada uh, kind of setting the pace here? Well, I would say that there are no rough equivalents. Um, the, if there are these review outlooks, they're primarily done by think tanks, but this is an academic enterprise. Uh, in that sense, then we bring primarily together, uh, primarily academics to focus on these subjects. Uh, there may be uh, more policy-oriented studies that my colleagues are aware of. There's a companion volume that has been published by, uh, I think, our Department of Public Administration on how Canada spends. And it documents the uh, spending the spending of the government over the course of the year, so we can track um, uh, the uh, primary areas where Canada is devoting interests, uh, whether it's trade, public finance, and so on. So, um, I would say, right. off the top of my head, there's no equivalent uh, uh, that I'm aware of, but maybe my colleagues know of some, some some something similar to it. Okay, sorry, Professor Chen, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David, for the kind intro and thank you, Solar. Yeah, I'll just say a couple of things first about my chapter um, without going into great detail, but just some of the key points and then try to say a couple of things uh, briefly about the broader lessons learned um, as far as uh, linking up for the entire collection and, and the foreign policy issues for Canada, as David so nicely um, laid out for us uh, with his opening uh, words. Um, my piece is in some regard, it focuses, my piece focuses in on the trade relationship between Canada and China. And of course, we have to think about that with Canada being so uh, reliant on exports to the United States. Of course, we have to think about it, Canada, China, US, as Sawar talked about triangulation at the start. Um, and so my, my piece in some ways um, is a bit of a scene setter 
Uh, also for Jeremy's, uh, Jeremy Paul Thiel's excellent chapter, which uh, deals with the security issues, uh, Madame Mung uh, and the two Michaels. Um, and in, in, in the sense that my piece, I think, um, gives us a sense that even before the relationship went into the almost crisis scenario that I think Jeremy will, will talk about, um, the Justin Trudeau government was already running into trouble as far as how it was dealing with China on the trade front. And I think in this regard, the broader lessons will also have some um, parallels, interesting parallels with what Elizabeth is, is talking about as far as Canada and infrastructure and development finance um, around the world, um, as far as policy space for Canada within which to operate globally. Um, but my, my basic, the, the basic point in my chapter is that is to ask what happened to the Canada-China discussions on a trade agreement, a bilateral trade agreement between Canada and China. There was talk when Justin Trudeau first came in in 2015, 2016, that there would be uh, an, an effort to, to um, talk to China about a free trade agreement. And by 2018, that, those discussions had fallen into the deep freeze. And so my, my, my chapter asked, what happened? Right? The intentions appeared to be there to make it happen, and then it didn't happen. And it just was put on the back burner. And part of this was, you know, Canada and China and the, the dynamics of what happened. And I go into great detail um, as far as what I could gather as a scholar on, you know, who was responsible for what and, and where the shortcomings were, um, who failed to basically to make this happen. But also I look at the, and, and it's not just a one-sided story. Canada obviously had agency in this. Um, and I go into detail about who was responsible for what and, and who may not have delivered as they were expected to. But also the Chinese were becoming tougher as a negotiating uh, partner. And, and I think the other big factor in here, and this is the other point, is that the United States. This is where the Donald Trump administration wanting, demanding that Canada uh, a, uh, renegotiate NAFTA, NAFTA 2.0, CUSMA, USMCA, um, that those negotiations and the pressure applied from Washington eventually basically um, uh, created enormous pressure such that the Trudeau government felt they had to put the other negotiations on the back burner. My point, though, is that where does this leave Canada longer term? So we have this NAFTA 2.0 with the United States, and that's very important for Canada. We also have the free trade agreement with the Europeans, with the EU. But what else? Where else in the world? And for Canada, we've We've, we've understood that we need some diversification options. China, of course, is the largest, fastest growing uh, market and economy in the fast growing Asian region. Of course, it's running into some challenges now. We're all now talking about India, which I understand. However, the largest and fastest growing market economy um, and market is where? It's China. And so in the end, ultimately for Canadian exporters, at some point, I think we're still going to have to come back to this question, what do we do about trade with China? And I think that, unfortunately, we haven't been set up, you know, because of past years, how can to handle this, our government? We're not set up very well for this discussion. And so part of this is trying to think through um, what are the longer term, medium term implications uh, from how we handled those FTA uh, discussions with the Chinese uh, up until now. Um, just uh, one other point here, and I guess this is the bigger lesson learned, is that, and, and I think Jeremy's chapter does this a very nice job of looking at this, and, and Elizabeth's as well, is the bigger lesson, I think this comes through in the entire volume, to make the link back up, is um, how well has the current government done in navigating the policy space within which, the global policy space within which, not, within which it now operates? Right? And it's clear that things are becoming more tense globally. There's more rivalry, geopolitical competition, as this uh, Can Among Nations volume looks at. The job of the government, and I hope Canadians think about it as well, is how do we best operate within arguably a more constricted policy space? And part of this is the U.S.-China relationship. Right? It's much tougher now. And so the question is 
to what degree is the current government doing a good job as far as foreign policy in figuring out how to navigate this? What is the policy space within which it now operates? And I think so from the trade side, I try my, my chapter says, OK, we now have NAFTA 2.0. But what else? I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, the, Gregory, that's an interesting point you make. My question would be, what can other countries that fall into the same tier as Canada learn from Canada's experience in this uh, in this matter. I mean, it seemed to me that once America stepped in and said, listen, this is a security issue. Uh, this is an issue of law. Uh, and there was an audit responsibility. These people haven't kept up to it. Uh, I mean, do, what do you think China could have done, if anything, uh, that could serve as a lesson to other countries? So I think the main lesson from the case study that I looked at, the FTA discussions, was that when you do try to do something like a trade agreement with China, you have to be really clear on what are the potential risks, not only for yourself, but in the case of Canada, for the United States, right? What are the potential risks or threats that might be entailed in that free trade agreement for others as well? Right? Canada operates within a kind of North American um, you know, uh, arrangement. And so you have to think that through and you have to be able to identify what those risks are and develop mitigation strategies. And you have to be able to communicate that with the U.S. government and Americans to explain, OK, we've taken the risk seriously, the potential risks, and this is how we're going to try to manage them. And some of the risks may be worth taking on and some of the risks are not. And this is these are the risks that we're willing to take on because these are the potential gains. And these gains are really important from a Canadian national interest standpoint. Right. So part of this is becoming really laser clear in your security and your strategy and your, you know, in, in your goals and on risks and potential threats. And I think this is where part of this is understanding that we're in a tougher world and that we're not, you can't just stand up and say, I'm going to try to protect the liberal order. Right. With great hubris announcing this in Parliament that Canada can somehow do this on its own. Right. Or even working with your allies. Right. This is working with the Europeans, working with others in Asia, for example, through a C, um, you know, the CPTPP. There's now talk that, you know, we're going to try to work with. So, yes, these are all important things. Right. And this is where we'll have to think through how to work multilaterally and bilaterally, but becoming very clear on potential risks, mm -hmm. threats, but also opportunities and be able to communicate that. Thank you, David, over to you. Well, just to add and then move on, um, what has uh, been suggested here is that uh, we are faced with uh, a dilemma in that um, should we pursue a, a more aggressive policy towards China, there may be foregone gains there. Uh, and yet at the same time, I think there's partly an initiative being undertaken within the United States for them to do precisely that. And the question is whether or not Canada's, to what extent, not whether if, but to what extent Canada's caught up in that agenda. Make no mistake about it. Um, the American ambassador to Canada recently appointed stated unequivocally that China was an existential threat to uh, the West, if not specifically to the US. And he was communicating that not to uh, his fellow citizens, but rather to Canadians. So there's no question that the American agenda is one of uh, deep concern. And I think uh, to help us understand why that is of deep concern, perhaps I hope Jeremy Altiel, my colleague at the Carleton University professor, can walk us through some of the, uh, the, the implications of the Meng, Meng Wanzhou uh, arrest and the detention of the two Michaels which is the focus of his chapter. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm very pleased to be part of this panel. Um, first, I want to point out, I mean, for our listeners, that China is Canada's second largest trading partner next to the U.S. So, um, uh, and a growing trading partner, even though our exports there have been faltering. And in many ways also, it's important and, and um, it's also a focus of... Uh, my colleague uh, Carlo Dade's chapter in our volume, um, Canada and the U.S. are actually competitors in the Chinese market in many areas, particularly 
in the area of agriculture, but also in energy. Um, and, um, and this, so in other words, when the United States um, is restricting Canadian trade with China, it's also sometimes favoring its own trade with China. And this is a problem that Canada has to face. <clears throat> has to face. Um, the detention of Meng Wanzhou, the uh, chief financial officer of Huawei Technologies on December 1st, 2018, um, followed a week later by the detention and arrest and then later conviction of Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, the latter of whom was a Canadian diplomat on secondment to the International Crisis Group, um, transformed Canada-China relations. Um, it could be compared in some sense with the Guzenko affair of 1945, which transformed, which, which when the, um, the Soviet cipher clerk who walked into the Mountie office with uh, piles of data showing Russian or Soviet spying in Canada during World War II, which helped shape Canada's, uh, Cold War response. It's not, these not, not exact convenience, but it, the 3M's affair is a kind of turning point. Um, as Greg has already shown, Canada's relationship with China had already deteriorated before the um, uh, the detention of Meng Wanzhou. Um, after the optimistic uh, initial years of nineteen of twenty fifteen and twenty sixteen, at which point uh, in twenty sixteen the Chinese Premier Li Keqiang hailed perhaps would be a new golden age in Canada-China relations. I think this gold has turned to lead. Um, and uh, um, the primary factor which deteriorated this relationship was the deteriorating relationship between the US and China. Um, but given the context of this was the, the relentless American campaign against Huawei technologies and its 5G technology, um, and again, I can, should point out to, to our listeners who may not know this, but no United States firm had chosen to take up the making of 5G switches. And Huawei te Technology, which is one of the few com companies along with uh, Nokia and Ericsson in S Sweden who developed 5G technology, but Huawei te Technologies um, 5G switches were developed with the help of, of engineers in Canada who used to work for a Canadian leading company called Nortel Technologies who went bankrupt and was under the chairmanship of a, a former U.S. Marine general uh, in the early 2000s. And uh, Huawei snapped up those engineers and built up its base in Canada and helped, helped develop a 5G switch. And so the United States not having a, a competitor and also having concerns Concerns about security and high tech. I'm not saying that none of these are legitimate, but there's there this is intertwined security and technology competition element here, which shouldn't be overlooked. Um, and had been looking closely at Huawei when they um, when as a matter of a, of a legal dispute having to do with uh, um, the uh, HSBC banks. Um, flouting of of, uh, of of sanctions against Iran, they came up with a present. They found a presentation that the HSBC uh, made to HSBC officers um, uh, about Huawei's activities in Iran, which they then used as a basis to form an arrest uh, or to put a sealed indictment um, against the uh, Meng Wanzhou, who's the CFO whom they knew would be traveling through Canada um, to Mexico. And they issued the next, and the United States Department of Justice issued an extradition request on her transit in Vancouver uh, between China and Mexico. And the Canadian government, which has an extradition treaty with the United States, complied with this request. Now, uh, so, Ever since, or since the, after December 1st, 2018, the Canadian government continued to uh, regard this as simply a legal matter regarding its extradition request to the United States and denied that there was any political motivation behind Canada's arrest. China never bought this. 
the Chinese government, and a week later arrested two Canadians. What was interesting is during this, the Canadian government maintained its approach saying that this is a matter of, of rule of law, a legal matter, not a political matter. By contrast, the arrest of the two Michaels was arbitrary and Canadian citizens and Canadian public could contrast the treatment of Ms. Meng Wanzhou, who I guess was living in a gilded cage, if you like, in Vancouver, all throughout the extradition request, who was on bail, out on bail um, with an ankle bracelet, with two luxury homes, um, whereas the two Michaels were sitting in a cell in China with the lights on 24 hours a day and subjected to um, unending interrogation. And this became basically, certainly turned the Canadian public against China and became part of the issue on which the va the values, the contrasting values of um, Canada and China became a primary factor which turned Canadians against the Chinese relation and of course helped build up the whole kind of security thing. This is that, that, that uh, notion of China as a threat, you know, what if we would do business in China and I go there and I'm arrested like Michael Spaber or something like that? So that was that was the, the context which changed the atmosphere in Canada. Um, and the Canadian government, um, although it was in full denial throughout the process that this was done in any way to align ourselves diplomatically and politically in the anti-China moves of the Trump administration, essentially ended up aligning by default. And even though um, partway through the um, the crisis, um, it sent out another ambassador, Dominic Barton, to China, who had close relationship um, with China through his work previously with the McKinsey Affair, who tried very hard, really unendingly, to try and improve the conditions for the two Michaels in detention, and even lobbied as a private citizen in Washington with the support of the Canadian government to try and, in some sense, withdraw the extradition request, which eventually did happen. Um, but, and he also tried to improve with China through the buying of PPE and other matters. But at the same, but regardless of this, the trend was sort of wash over the negative impact of the two, of the detention of the two Michaels, culminating in the abrupt release of the two Michaels, supposedly after they were convicted already, as soon as Ms. the extradition request was dropped by the United States in September of 2021, um, seemed to say, the Canadian said, that gives the lie that this was a legal matter from the Chinese perspective or a security matter, and um, and and sort of left a, a bitter and sour taste in Canada. And immediately after, you can see the signs of this immediately after, uh, the um, two Michaels were released, the Canadian um, foreign minister and the government says that free trade is now completely off the table with China. Even though, I mean, interestingly enough, two years earlier, just be before the arrest of, uh, or detention rather, of Meng Wanzhou, Canada had at the 11th hour signed on to Clause 32A, 3210A of the KUSMA, or we call KUSMA, or the USMCA, which actually said forbade or, or gave the United States veto over a free trade agreement with a non-market economy, which was a signal for China. Um, nonetheless, Canada had not completely abandoned, taken it off the table, but after the two Michaels came back, he took it off the table. A few months later, we also then banned Huawei technologies and ZTE from um, being used in Canadian 5G networks, telecom networks. Um, and further down the line, started to develop our own Indo-Pacific strategy, um, which those of us who are specialists know the Indo-Pacific is a code word or almost a full equivalent for containment of China. And even though, again, it's interesting how the other kind of Canadian government tries slightly to triangulate here our Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, the people on the advisory committee, there's not one defense official, there's not one security official, 
and there may many people involved there are involved with trade with Asia and human rights and human rights people. So in other words, Canada is trying to softly signal that it doesn't necessarily want to subscribe to containment of China. At the same time, the vocabulary says we sort of are aligning with the United States. And this is also then further symbolized when a Canadian um, Royal Canadian Navy ship escorted U.S. Navy ship through the Taiwan Strait last fall. Hey, so, Jeremy, let me ask you a question. I'm sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt, but this just came to my mind. A long time ago, a senior foreign ministry official in Canada, uh, we were discussing the very issue that you are raising through your conversation. And he mm -hmm. told me, Sarwar, one thing you should remember is when you join the Canadian Foreign Service and you're making your way up, you must understand that argue as much as you want in public meetings, table whatever objections you want, but when the vote is taken, you will always vote with the United States. <laughs> well, sometimes much, we don't. How much has changed, do you think? Sometimes we don't, but, but, but I think what happens is that, I, I think, you know, David will probably agree with me on this, is that what happens is that Canada sometimes doesn't go along with the United States. We didn't go into Iraq, for example, but we don't publicly criticize the United States the way, uh, except very rarely, uh, but we didn't publicly criticize the Iraq incursion, we, but we didn't go along, go there. We were, unlike, we were unlike the French in that particular affair. So that's the, the general way in which to do But the interesting point, and I think the point that Greg would come about and Carlo would come, is the question is when we essentially aligned with the with the Trump administration, administration which we didn't like, which Canadians didn't like, whose approach we didn't like, who we felt bullied by, but we aligned with them willy-nilly on the on the um, detention of Hmong. Um, we didn't publicly consider what the strategic implications were for Canadian trade policy worldwide, implication for th relations with Africa and other places where we, we have interests. Um, we had, um, we are a member of the Asian Inf Infrastructure Investment Bank. Um, so we took a position different from the United States on that. Um, nonetheless, nonetheless, the, the tilt of security relations towards, towards China without any further investment. This is what's peculiar about it. If Canadian security things, we are much more invested in NATO and in Europe than we are in the Pacific. We have practically no assets there, practically none to send. And we have no intention of building assets. There's no, We're not going to be building nuclear submarines um, with the help of the United States. So I have another question, but I'm going to hold it till... Uh, so, so that's... Till the, so that's through, so right? And what, where our final is is, and I just wanted to, to segue to Elizabeth Cobbett. I mean, Canada had this middle power relationship in which we tried to play a global role. But now we've sort of retreated into this um, alignment with the United States on, over almost all issues without, uh, with, and essentially abandoning any independent global role. And that's been, in, in some sense, the turning point was the 3Ms affair. Okay. Yeah. David. So uh, there's a couple of clear takeaways from what we've heard so far. One is that Canada is a uh, very adept diplomatic player in the what we would call constructive ambiguity approach to foreign policy. Uh, and that's what Jeremy has highlighted, as well as, as Greg. Um, and this is a, a strategy, I think, of coping uh, under pressure in that we cannot, as you've said, alienate one player without uh, incurring the wrath of the other. But there's also something else that needs to be pointed out that while Canada's experiences are, are relatively in, instructive and reflective of what's going on in this triangular relationship, they are not unique. So the pressure brought to bear by the United States to disengage from uh, Huawei in particular was significant. It was most significant to, for the five I countries uh, it's often quoted that the, a British minister was involved in the uh, uh, technology side, uh, overseeing the deployment of Huawei and 5G networks in the UK, was told under no circumstances should the UK continue to use 5G. 
we, in other words, the UK uh, pulled the plug on Huawei because the US told us to. And I think if you look, if you do a survey of those countries who are, if not partially fully banning Huawei, that it is very much the pressure brought to bear by the United States. And the important point of this volume is to show that this is not narrowly defined uh, interests. This is rather that encompasses all aspects of the U.S. relationship with many of its trading partners. So Carlo Dade was mentioned, but there are also other chapters that walk us through the implications beyond simply uh, a narrowly defined area such as the 5G architecture. And this is a significant concern because countries may see themselves being hemmed in. And as a result, their freedom and their freedom to maneuver and pursue an alternative course of action, a foreign policy that, where they can derive benefits uh, from trading with China as well as other countries are going to be curtailed. And we could talk ad infinitum about this, but the, uh, the segue into Elizabeth's piece is important because what we saw is not so much uh, U.S. driven by uh, overarching security concerns, but simply being outpaced by a more able competitor. The truth is that U.S. still doesn't have a, a rival to uh, Huawei's 5G architecture that it can deliver on a global basis. And this is this is the sad outcome, the reality that we can Canadians have to confront after having been pushed and pulled on the 3M scandal to the point that we are now perhaps undermining our own interests by disengaging from a very able competitor. So to walk us through the the implications for uh, devel development financing, where China is a country that spends in the billions, whereas Canada spends in the millions. We have a chapter from Elizabeth Cobbett, who has recently moved to Plymouth University in the UK. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you, Sawa. And thank you both to Greg and Jeremy. There's so much to say that I'm not going to have enough time to say, but I want to pick up perhaps on two things as an entry point with what Jeremy said. The first thing is that infrastructure is geopolitics. And what is taking place on Africa, on African continent is the geopolitics of infrastructure development. So 5G is an example, but when you have an entire continent that is developing along those lines um, and Canada not being present, that has implications. And you, you mentioned as well, Jeremy, the Indo-Pacific uh, region and how Canada really isn't um, invested or perhaps have any clear foreign policy in that area. So how to say so much in such a short time? Infrastructure counts, Africa counts, and Asia counts. When I was invited to do a reflection on the chapter of how Canada's um, development finance figures into explaining its position as a country among nations, I decided to look at East Africa. And East Africa is hugely strategic because of its, its intersections between the Middle East, between African continent, which is undergoing huge changes, and because of its links to the Indo-Pacific. So whereas before, formerly of the last 500 years, we have been centered on an Atlantic or North Atlantic world, we are now moving into an Indo-Pacific world, which of course everybody is thoroughly aware of. And within that, we have a continent um, that is, so we, I would, what I would like to say as well is that we are moving into a global South world. Around the Indian Ocean are 2 billion people. The Pacific Asian are 4.3 billion people. Africa's population is just over a million. It's going to double to 2.5 billion in 2050s. We are looking at a world which will be centered around the Indian Ocean and the Indo Pacific. And within that, the African continent is going is already becoming the youngest continent in the world. And with the wonders of innovation and energy and artificial intelligence and tech and all that's being built, and which is reliant on the, exactly the type of infrastructure we've been talking about. So where does Canada sit within this bigger geopolitical picture. So when I decided to take East African, compare China and Canada, it seemed like a very unfair comparison. And yet I think it tells us a lot about what Canada is or is not doing within foreign policy to understand the African continent. 
So as I think David said, it's 12, 124 million that Canada has invested in East Africa, whereas in China it's in the billions. But the takeaway is that when I was working through the chapter, it is though Ch Canada is still sit sitting within the 20th century and hasn't moved to the geopolitics of the 21st century. It's thinking about, so what is it doing in, in, in development finance? It's working on women's empowerment, which is absolutely fine. The sustainable development goals, absolutely good. <clears throat> Climate change. But it's investing very little. And the way it's investing is in line with this idea of building a middle class, of building you know, small to medium-sized enterprises and businesses. And that, quite frankly, is like looking at the color of the tiles or the doorknobs you're going to be put on the house that is being built by <laughs> Asian countries. So Canada's kind of looking at questions that seem very 20th century in the way that it's doing it. Whereas really, Africa, I'm sure most of you are aware, the African Development Bank says one billion investment per year is needed to get the continent moving. So it's let's take the 124 million that Canada was doing. Let's say it doesn't want to increase any more. What it is doing is still very much this idea that by financing small and medium businesses, you're going to meet the development needs of Africa. Everybody is clear that what will be meeting that is huge infrastructure projects. Africans are very, <laughs> very um, business oriented. They're excellent at doing that. What they miss are the roads and the infrastructure and the railways. So for example, yesterday, Kenya announced um, the investment by a Korean, South Korean company to help uh, change the um, highway between Mombasa and Nairobi into a dual carriageway. That's what Kenya needs because 95% of the cargo that arrives in Mombasa goes through Nairobi into the inner lake areas of East Africa and into Central of Africa. It needs highways, it needs ports, you need um, infrastructure such as IT, undersea cables. We, we are really talking about redressing and shaping a continent which has huge pressure of the um, demographic boom and bulge of the youth. Most Africans are now under the age of 25. And predictions are it's going to double. We're going to have a young continent. Whereas um, the International Labour Organization says only 25% of Africans have a formal employment relationship. 76% of Africans make their own business. Mm -hmm. So when you compound that with a demographic boom that's going to be taking place, you have a lot of urgency. So it seems to me that Canada is kind of fiddling at the edges of a discourse in the 20th century, which no longer meets the needs of Africa, never, no longer meets the needs of a rapidly changing world, which is going towards the global south. And it seems to me in, a, in the way of foreign policy, because we are used to a rule-based liberal order, we seem to have been, Canada that is, forget the link between infrastructure geopolitics, governance, and power. And we are actually moving into a world that is being materially reorganized. And I do not know whether Canada is unaware, unconcerned, or caught in a meta-narrative about Africa, or simply doesn't have anybody on the ground feeding that back into Ottawa. Hey, Elizabeth, so, a quick question for you. Yeah, sure. Uh, do you think that what you just so brilliantly described is also a result of what your colleagues have been saying throughout this program, which is the almost lock that America has on Canada's foreign policy and international strategy? I mean, one reason it seems to me that America has not done very much for Africa is because of the so-called Washington consensus, that American lending largely follows a rule about uh, free markets and capitalism and empowerment of people and so on, whereas Canada, whereas China has for years now done what you suggest, which is looked at what 
uh, what uh, Africa really needs. So do you think that Canada's uh, input into Africa may be another side to the reflection of this lock that America has on Canadian foreign policy? I honestly, this is like the sound of really quite an outrageous thing to say, but I think it comes from a position of ignorance. I think that people simply do not know what's happening on the ground in Africa. And I think they do not have enough people. I think the United States is beginning to. We see that with Biden. We see that with holding Africa-US summit. We haven't seen the equivalent in Canada at all. Um, I would say... Like I said, this may sound proper, sort of a certain ignorance and laziness about what Africa is about. It's it's not being up to date. It's not being in Africa, across Africa and talking to Africans because you only have to travel there and you're in a different world. The conversations are entirely different. So when I move around, I go to either here, Britain or Canada, it's like you go through a time warp or you go through a membrane and you don't understand the conversations because they're not sure what's happening, say, in Nairobi or Addis Ababa. So is Canada being constrained by the United States? I mean, that would be a nice excuse, but I don't believe it is. I think that Canada knows, for example, its advantages through mining. I think it just has neglected the continent. And yet I would say that Canada has an interesting position where it decides to change because it is neither a former imperial power and the former imperial powers know exactly what's happening. Britain does, France does, they are there, Germany does. But Canada just seems to be neglecting this. So as, as um, a country that doesn't have that legacy, there would be room and it doesn't have the same, you know, I mean, United States is not resented across, I mean, generalized across Africa, but I think Canada could come in and take a different position by being a non, you know, former colonial master. And I think that that gives it a lot of potential and space to do something different. I think it is simply that nobody's feeding into or nobody's gone to visit in a way that really understands the the, for me, seismic uh, shifts that are underway. David? Well, um, I see that our time is coming to a close, so I will simply, uh, I'm not even going to try and summarize what we've we've heard from each chapter. Uh, and if there's time permitted, uh, we could go back to each author to comment on where we go from here. I think Elizabeth has framed it quite nicely that Canada's a non-player in certain areas. Jeremy has suggested that uh, we have drawn inwards, as, as does the U.S. draw inwards to become more self-reliant, if you will. It's the new economic nationalism, with friend shoring being the the watchword. Uh, and Greg suggesting that uh, we are at the mercy of uh, a divided leadership. Who really, uh, I'm not going to suggest they they don't have a plan going forward, but there's some suggestion that perhaps. Uh, they are at the mercy of, uh, to some extent, U.S. influence over our policy direction. This does not portend well for Canada's place in the world if you're someone who believes that Canada has been an engaged multilateral player uh, and uh, upholds the rule of law or rules-based system simply because it's in our interest to do so, to strengthen the capacity of states to trade with Canada uh, in a predictable uh, fashion so that we benefit mutually. We're in a, a system where I, can't, I think one can safely say Canada's influence has diminished. But my question to each author is whether or not this has to be and what we might need to do to change that. So let's go around quickly and have people answer that. Uh, I want to make sure that before we end the program, David, you let the viewers know how they can get a copy of your book. Uh, and while we go around and have people answer it, and no more than a minute, minute, uh, please, for this, uh, if you would care to say one thing that America can do to help this equation uh, with, with Canada, what might that be? So, uh, uh, David, with your permission, I'll say uh, we'll, we'll go with Elizabeth, Gregory, and Jeremy. What I would say, it's, it's about scale. It's about scale. It's about understanding that we, we're not talking about a rules-based or written or a, the Bretton Woods consensus. We're talking about physically reorganizing the built environment 
on which we live. Therefore, it is about scale. Nothing is inevitable. We know that Canada could make a change. It's used to doing scale. It does mining, for heaven's sakes. That's about scale. It's about re-understanding the position. And I, do, and I think I would say that the United States has cottoned on to that much quicker than what appears to be the case within Canada or in Ottawa. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Um, David's points were excellent, as, as were Elizabeth and Jeremy. Um, three points. I think there's actually, like in this world of, of growing great power competition, I agree with actually the Ken Among Nations the previous year, last year, before ours. Lloyd Axworthy said that there's actually a great opportunity for Canada and, and a great need for Canada to step up and play more of an international leadership role. But what do we mean by that? Not only our liberal internationalism, but our middle power role, but not in the sense of middle power of just upholding whatever order of the 20th century, as, as Elizabeth was saying, but to look at the how Canada operate at the end of the Cold War period, the, the last Cold War period, where Canada acted as a bridge between extremes. And I think that's what we have to, as Canada, go back to. And I hope that, Sarwar, to your question, the Americans, we can work that out with the Americans. At the end of the Cold War, the Americans were in a situation with Canada where I think it was rather enlightened on the part of the Americans to see that it was useful to have a Canada that could actually play that bridging role in the world. I would like to echo some of what Greg has said um, and assume of what... The United States should leave some space for Canada to act independently. The problem I see in my conclusion is that Canada has failed to look strategically at the world. We do have limited capacity. If scale matters, we can't be scale, give scale on everything. We can give scale on some things. But to that means we have to concentrate on something, concentrate our resources on particulars. And if without actually making a, a, an overall view but where Canada could contribute best, we're not we're we'll unable to concentrate our resources. Unfortunately, our political system, our minority government, and the fact that we're in a transition away from the Atlantic world that which, which we're so familiar with makes us has somehow disabled us from making these strategic calculations. And I would wish that Ottawa would be more strategic. I would wish that the United States would be more understanding in terms of that it needs partners who are on the same page in the values and, and thing, but who can do different things to be allowed to do something different in order to bridge some of the, uh, of the things rather than going to a hard and fast uh, new Cold War, which I think the whole world will be losers. David, over to you. Well, I think uh, the next step for us is to uh, bring in uh, like-minded countries and start sharing ideas because this is, I, I think I've stressed this before, this is not unique to Canadian experiences, but it is one that is driven home by the fact that we sleep uh, beside a, a very powerful nation, not necessarily sleeping with, but we, we reside close by and we often find ourselves being uh, rolled over and... Uh, crushed by this more powerful player to use their awful metaphor. But the, uh, the idea of the mouse and the elephant, I guess, is one way to look at it. The, the question of whether or not um, it is in our interest to work more closely with the U.S. is, is, is an open-ended one, but it seems to now be the one that is driven by consensus. And we are the victims of our own circumstances. We've created these circumstances in which we've uh, arrived at an outcome which is not necessarily in the long run of benefit to Canada, but we find ourselves uh, unable to shift out of a position where we uh, are comfortable with a much more tighter relationship with our neighbor to the south. We need a frank conversation with other countries. I can tell you that there are there is an important need to bring in uh, the bigger countries as well as our countries equivalent to us like Australia, New Zealand. Uh, I'd like to see the Southeast Asian nations brought into this discussion of how they're navigating this more turbulent world. Certainly, it's not going to plan according to uh, Joe Biden's plan of building an alliance of democracies. So far, I mean, the evidence is mixed. So um, there's a lot of work to be done here. And if people are interested in getting a better handle on the volume itself, 
uh, they want to access individual chapters, they can do so online. The volume is published by Palgrave Macmillan, and it's an imprint of Springer uh, Publishing Company. So they would go to the Springer uh, link website. I can share that information with you, Sarwar, so you can distribute it amongst your followers. Um, and they can access each chapter individually. If they have an institutional subscription, they can do so more easily just by downloading each chapter. But the good news is that this book is available online, obviously available through Amazon and the other publishers, and it's reasonably priced as a Kindle version. So um, I look forward to, if your audience has an opportunity to give us feedback and comments for a follow-up discussion, more than happy to uh, participate in that or have other uh, participants from the volume draw be drawn into this discussion. But I think it's only the beginning of a much more important discussion. So I want to thank each of our contributors, as well as you, for giving us the opportunity to showcase some of the talent that's coming out of Canada. Uh, it's great to see, you know, an opportunity to really tell people what's going on in this country. We always are seen as the, the reasonable, level-headed, likable country, but I think what we're facing now is we have to be a little tougher, a little meaner. Well, thank you very much, uh, but David, and thank you, Jeremy and Elizabeth and Gregory. And uh, of course, as an American, I can't let this uh, opportunity pass uh, to, uh, to tell you about one instance in which Canada, one of many instances, I'm sure, where Canada has powerfully uh, changed the direction and gave, uh, given uh, the compass to America to uh, to uh, to go in a direction which America had not thought of, and that was during the 9-11 attacks. Uh, someone who I've worked with, uh, Nick Burns, uh, who is now the American ambassador to uh, China, was then, uh, had just been sent to NATO as the American representative of NATO, and 9-11 took place. And Nick Burns was there, freshman, trying to figure out what to do, uh, and it was the Canadian ambassador who went to him and said, Nicholas, how about getting NATO to declare Article 5, which is basically attack on one of us is an attack on all. And Burns told me that he thought about that and he said, did he really have the power to do this? And the Canadian ambassador was the one who held his hand and said, Nicholas, we will all follow you. And that's then what happened. So Canada has, and I'm sure uh, will continue uh, to, uh, to impact the scenario as we go along. But as uh, David and the rest of you have said, the world is changing. We are securitizing uh, ahead of geopolitics. Uh, so that remains to be seen. But this has been a totally, totally wonderful uh, conversation. And I would encourage people to get hold of this book. Uh, when we send out an alert on this program, I'll make sure and have the, uh, uh, the cover and also double check with David about, uh, about uh, how you should buy it. Uh, so uh, now, without uh, any further ado, we've run out of time. So let me thank our viewers from around the world to be part of this conversation. And until the next Polaris Live, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.